everyone. Welcome back to the podcast, Byzantium and Friends. I'm Anthony, your host. So I'm glad to say that my two-month vacation didn't cost this podcast any of its uh, listenership. The data that I have suggests that about a third of you tune into every episode as it comes out. That's about 2,000 people. And there are another 4,000 that are taking their while working through the inventory. Uh, So some of you have quite a few episodes left to catch up. Uh, but I can actually see the graph as it kind of declines. Interestingly enough, some episodes that have more provocative or sort of interesting titles have a little spike, like you go check those out first and then go back and work your way through the inventory. I, I, I know this through aggregate data only. I don't, I, don't, I don't have any information about your individual choices. Anyway, it was good to know that I can take a break every once in a while without jeopardizing the whole project. So on to our topic today. Uh, Many listeners of this podcast will know that there is a discussion currently underway uh, about taking the Byzantines' Roman identity seriously. Um, And this was very much an identity in the sense that it it is something reflected in the narratives that they told about who they were as a collective, uh, stories of their origins and the associations of their name and just generally who they were. Uh, This means that it makes a difference when you're writing their history, when, when we as modern historians are writing their history, uh, to take those um, narratives seriously, to take that identity seriously, and to position the story that we are talking about in into alignment with the stories that they told about who they were. Um, this is generally not done in modern scholarship. Um, the um, so ra- their abstract and empty term Byzantines has kind of acted as a placeholder for where that narrative should be. Um, in some cases, you might find um, efforts to elide the Roman identity and sort of slip in a Greek one. Um, instead, this is often in deference to Western sources, uh, medieval Western pers- um, perspectives or modern Greek national perspectives. Uh, which are by no means dominant um, in in Greece, by the way. Now, why is this important? Well, as historians, when we're writing a history, it is very important to be clear um, what we are writing the history of. Um, So the choices that we make at that level are sort of fundamental in determining the rest of our uh, project. Uh, So there's a big difference between telling the story of a self-defined community, in this case a political community of the East Romans, uh, versus telling the story of a land or a city and its, uh, you know, different inhabitants over time, the cultural changes that occurred there, without that topic being defined by the stories told by those people, which change over time. They might have had one religion at one point and changed to another religion later on. They might have self-identified as Greeks in one phase, self-identified as Christians in the next, and so forth. So there are a number of different through lines that we can follow, right, through the course of what we call Byzantine history. And these can be, you know, self-ascriptive. They can be um, geographical. They can be economic or thematic or um, agricultural or topical. Or they can be literary and linguistic. Um, So, for example, I worked my way into this story through an interest in primarily the Greek language. Um, I am in a classics department, um, and what I found fascinating was the range of historical periods of cultures, religions, expressions, and thought that one can access by studying the long duration of the Greek language. And I mean this from like linear B and sort of Mycenaean Greek all the way to modern Greek. It's just a fascinating spectrum that one can cover and observe so much of human history and thought by learning this one language that compared to other languages has not changed that much. I mean, it's changed, uh, but over the course of that kind of time span, so we're talking about three and a half thousand years, comparatively not that much. And honestly, the history of Greek writing and Greek literature, like what you find in the texts, is not overdetermined by the kinds of changes that um, we see in the religious domain or in the domain of political or national identity. So, for example, 
Greek literature just breezes right through, right past changes from ancient religion to Christianity, from Greek identity to Roman identity, and then much later on back again. And it, it carries on with its own traditions that are sort of independent um, of those changes. So the way in which we define the narrative that we're telling produces a different modern story. And there's no right or wrong choice here necessarily. It, it, it really is a matter of what is the story that we're trying to tell. And this is where we come to the book of my guest today. This is called The Greeks, A Global History, and it is by Roderick Beaton, um, who has had a long career of writing about uh, Byzantine literatures, especially late Byzantine literature uh, from the 12th century on uh, down to modern Greece. Um, has written about modern Greek literature and is now writing books on history, so modern Greek history, and has just now published this book, um, The Global, Global History of the Greeks, which reaches from the earliest antiquity, for, like from the earliest point where we can talk about Greek speakers down to today. So the book makes an explicit choice to define as its subject matter uh, people who spoke Greek regardless of how they self-identified, uh, right? Whether as uh, Achaeans or Hellenes or Greeks or Christians or Romans or whatever, but to tell the story of Greek speakers however they self-identified. Now, Roddy and I talk about that choice uh, in the conversation. But before we get to it, I want to uh, provide some clarity on a, a name that comes up in the conversation that refers to a particular uh, sort of Greek national way of viewing that history that is not the approach that he takes. Uh, this name is Paparigopoulos, as in the 19th century Greek historian uh, Constantine Paparigopoulos, um, who is often credited with devising the sort of modern national schema of Greek history. And it, it sort of kind of roughly goes as follows, that there has always been a Greek people, and its history can be charted and written about from antiquity to the present, and you know, they are the Greek people, and regardless of what uh, names they appear under, and that this history is continual, and it has gone through different phases. And in particular, there's the ancient phase, and there's the medieval Byzantine phase, and then there is the modern phase, and they are all phases of, this, of the history of the same group. Now, this is not the approach um, that um, Roddy takes in his book. Among many other differences, um, I can just point to the fact that in the 21st century, we're much more um, aware of uh, the importance of identity. That is what, you know, how groups or individuals self-identify as and that that needs to be worked into our stories and that we can't just presuppose um, a kind of monolithic national history that kind of exists behind um, all of the very big cultural and religious changes that take place in the meantime. Secondly, Paparigopoulos' scheme uh, came together under non-ideal circumstances. Um, and specifically, uh, I'm going to simplify things a little bit here, but um, there was a, a German scholar of the early 19th century, um, Falmerayer, who had argued that there was no sort of biological continuity between ancient and modern Greeks and that it had been disrupted and that modern Greeks were just a bunch of, you know, Slavs and Albanians who had learned a bad version of Greek and were pretending to be Greeks and that, and that Western Europeans shouldn't be uh, uh, tricked by that. And this, of course, challenged and undermined the whole narrative of continuity from antiquity that modern Greece, fresh out of the revolution, uh, was not only promoted, promoting, but needing to promote in order to maintain um, enthusiastic Western support for the project of a modern Greek state. And so this need to be, needed to be countered. And so the narrative of continuity that emerged in the later 19th century and that was continued into the 20th century had behind it a sometimes uh, hidden but sometimes open racial component. And this was sort of forced on Greek thought by Western European racial thinking and specifically of Falmerayer. And so it resulted in this mm, non-ideal rushed job 
of constructing a history of national continuity that was really trying to assert a narrative of racial continuity, which then it became very vicious. It continued into the 20th century. Um, I am optimistic that the national narrative is shedding that component. Um, I don't think that most Greeks would insist on it, um, but it, it was not the best way to construct uh, a sort of long-term idea of Greek history. And, and so I'm glad to see that it's heading out the door. Anyway, this is why it's important that Roddy constructs his history of the Greeks around the language that was spoken and is very, very open to, you know, both uh, obviously, you know, influxes of people into the group who speak that language, but also to the changes in their culture and, and self-ascriptive identity claims that they made um, over the long period that's covered uh, in this book, which I strongly recommend uh, for the following reasons. It's both erudite and accessible, and I don't think that there's anything quite like it out there in that it covers such a large expanse of time and the history of the speakers of the Greek language, whether they self-identified as Greek or not. It, the book nicely sidesteps precisely all of the problems that I mentioned in this overlong introduction. There are very few people um, who command all of this material in the way that he does, so uh, writing this kind of synthesis is very difficult. Um, and I was very happy that it was done um, now for possibly the first time in this way uh, by someone who does have both experience of and sympathy for the Byzantine millennium that's situated right in the middle um, of the story. Anyway, I've gone on uh, enough. <laughs> I'm sorry about that, but uh, I felt that these issues are important enough that they needed clarification um, so that you know something about the Sort of contested background of some of the choices that we all make. Uh, so uh, without any further delay, um, uh, here's my conversation with Roddy Beaton. Uh, thanks also to Medievalist.net for reposting these episodes on their website. Roderick Beaton, welcome to the podcast. Hello, very glad to be with you. So you've been publishing quite a number of books uh, lately in, in the past decade on, on modern Greece primarily. Uh, you've published a book on Byron, the life of the poet Byron, but seen through the lens of his Philhellenism and his activities in Greece during the Greek Revolution. You also published a, um, a history of Greece, modern Greece, which you call biography of a modern nation. And just now you published a book, The Greeks, a global history, which is from deepest antiquity all the way to the present. So it's been a very busy decade for you. Well, thank you. Yes, I mean that—that that is among the benefits of retiring from be, being a full-time professor. Or something, <laughs> something you can, look forward to. That. Something you can look forward to too. Um, yes, I mean it's nice you to mention those previous books. I mean, in a way, this uh, "The Greeks: A Global History" is a kind of extended prequel to my last book, which I called slightly provocatively uh, "Greece: Biography of a Modern Nation," and I think particularly for Greek readers, the fact that I was defining Greece as a modern nation um, rather cut across a traditional Greek way of looking at Greek identity and the world, whereby Greece is a very old nation. And um, I kind of wanted to explain why I think, you know, why I think of the modern period of Greek history as a national story. Um, and that's what I told in that book. But in the mm. new book, I'm looking at the whole long story, which again, in Greek, is traditionally thought of as the history of a nation. Um, but as we might tease out as the conversation develops, I'm not quite presenting it in that traditional way. Yes, I was actually going to ask you about the title of the the modern the modern nation book uh, when I was just looking through your your bibliography uh, earlier this uh, this morning in, in preparation, because it struck me that there are at least three ways in which the, the subtitle biography of a modern nation might be uh, provocative, as you as you put it. Uh, first is the idea of a biography, that, of a nation having a biography, uh, which um, actually maybe is not that provocative. I mean, lots of things are getting biographies right now, including, you know, monuments and languages and things like that. 
But I was wondering when I saw modern nation, whether you meant it as modern, let's say in the sense of, let's say cutting edge, like, like that it is a modern nation and not, not, some, not a nation trying to catch up, which is a view that, uh, that many Greeks have about modern Greece, that it's not quite modern, but trying to be modern, but that you're asserting that, no, it's actually in the, in the front rank of modern nations, let's say, or that you were trying to make a distinction between the modern nation and the ancient one, but that's not what you were doing. No, I mean, I was taking the view that, I was taking a deliberately narrow view of nations and nationalism, which is one that's quite fashionable in the academic world in um, Britain and America over the last sort of 40, 50 years, whereby nations in the modern sense are a, you know, an element of the modern world. It's a way of thinking and organizing okay. political societies that really begins in the middle of the 18th century and has come to dominate the world today. And if you take that very narrow understanding of a nation, then it's anachronistic to talk about the ancient Greeks or indeed the ancient Egyptians or the ancient Hebrews as a nation. Um, and I'm very conscious, I didn't quite put it like this in the book, but I have done this in teaching, of, of a, a conscious, I mean, a deliberate circularity of argument. If you define a nation as right. a modern you're then defining a people in the modern world in terms of the modern nation right, yeah. and leaving open the question of what the ancestors of these people might have been or done or thought of themselves as being in earlier periods. So I wanted really to look at the biographical, biographized history of the last 300 years of the Greek mm -hmm. people in terms of the consolidation of a national identity, the creation of a national state, which is what we know as Greece today, and then the achievements and trials of that state um, through the 200 years now of its existence. But throughout that book, and indeed in the new book as well, um, I'm always very keen to emphasize the significance of the creation of a Greek nation state because in the three and a half thousand year history of the Greek speaking people, there never was such a thing before. Right. And I think many Greeks have kind of been, uh, you know, sort of charmed in their school days by the glorious ancestors and the uh, sort of endless promotion of the Acropolis and the marbles and the statues, um, the wonders of ancient Greece. And this idea that actually anything that you know, we in inverted commas can do after that is going to be second rate and belated and secondary. And I'm saying, well, actually, no, if you look at the whole history, the ancient Greeks never managed to do this. This is something that the modern Greeks actually did in the 19th century for the very first time. And not only that, um, Greece with its successful revolution that began in 1821, and its international recognition as sovereign and independent in 1830 actually marks the first new nation state in the old world in the 19th century. The United States of America was the very first on the other side of the Atlantic. Yes. At the same time as Greece and a little before it, the South American and Central American Caribbean republics were uh, gaining their independence. But in the old world of Europe, the nearest thing you got was the French Revolution, which with apologies to our French friends was not a great success, at least in the short term. And after the defeat of Napoleon in 1815, you know, Europe went back to or created a new kind of European, very politically conservative uh, status quo, um, which against all the odds, the Greeks were actually the first to break down and the Greek nation state created in the 1830s out of the revolution of the 1820s then becomes the very first historically of all the nation states that have now come to predominate all over Europe and indeed in many other parts of the world. You have Greece in 1830, followed by Belgium in 1831, the great European revolutions of 1848, but they didn't, uh, they didn't produce great changes until the 1850s and 60s with the, uh, the unifications of Italy and Germany, both completed in 1871 
So you've got a whole story of how Europe changes from the, uh, the autocratic, multilingual, multi-ethnic empires that dominated until the 18th century, and then the predominance of self-determining nation states that begins during the 19th and really gathers momentum after the First World, First World War. And Greece is right in at the beginning of that. So this, it's in that rather stronger sense that I argue that Greece is a modern nation. The creation by the Greeks of a sense yeah. of nationhood and its culmination in an actual nation state is something that lots of other people were thinking about at the same time. They were part of a worldwide movement, but the Greeks actually got it, you know, got it right first. Yes, um, it's, uh, it was a kind of, in this sense, a pioneer in, in creating the uh, national state model that has become normative since then, but at the time it, it wasn't. And, That's exactly uh, what it was, yes. Yes, yeah. No, you're exactly right about the French Revolution. I'm reading a long history of it right now. Um, Simon Shama's you know, Citizens, and uh, it's, 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 you can see how they sort of sp sped, pa sped past the nation state phase within a couple of years and went straight to empire and, <laughs> and, and then back again. And anyway, so yeah, that wasn't a very stable um, uh, you know, revolution compared to the Greek one in that sense. Although in, in many ways, much more, um, in, you know, impactful on the rest of Europe. The interesting thing about the Greek revolution is that it had some uh, fascinating repercussions in the Muslim world that haven't been studied much by European historians. And now we're digressing, but, you know, that's the point, I guess, of these kinds of conversations, that Greece was enabled by the Western powers, the European powers, to break away from the Ottoman Empire. And this led many Muslim intellectuals and sort of proto-national thinkers in all of the European empires, you know, especially in the British Empire, to think, wait, if, the, if you let the Christian subjects of the Ottoman Empire create their nation state, why aren't you letting us Muslim subjects of Christian empires create our nation state? And, and, and Greece was the one that, the, the case that sort of, it sort of inflamed public opinion in many of these places. No, I think that's absolutely right. And, you know, the culmination of that process is exactly 100 years after the Greek War of Independence, right. when the Turks fought their own War of Independence. And the Greeks and the Turks must be the only people in world history who each have fought a War of Independence against the other. Yes. And the modern Turkish Republic was established out of a War of Independence against the invading Greeks yes. in 1919 to 1922. It is a complicated relationship. Uh, okay, so let's turn to the um, more recent book, uh, The Greeks of Global History. F first, I want to uh, point out one uh, interesting thing about the book and about you, uh, which is that most diachronic studies of Greek things tend to focus very much on classical antiquity, uh, obviously a very sort of valorized period in both modern Greek and you know, Western European imagination, and then on the modern nation state. And they tend to kind of skim the period in between, um, or they're not much interested in it, or to be frank, they don't know very much about it. Um, and so there's a kind of lag in the middle. And the, the general idea is to jump from antiquity to modernity or, 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 or the reverse um, and, and skip a lot of the stuff in between. Now, there are obviously exceptions, Megalexiu and, and many others have, have you know, it brought the Byzantine millennium into those kinds of discussions uh, from a place of expertise, uh, but you're pretty rare in actually having, you know, you're grounded in, in Byzantine material. I mean, and so far as I'm a Byzantinist, I work with, I, I encounter your work mostly on the, the well, what's it called? The medieval Greek romance, I think. Uh, I mean, yes. Well, I mean, I've worked on very specific areas of the Byzantine yes. millennium, but I'm, I would never claim to be a Byzantinist in the sense that you are. No, but I mean, you're comfortable in, in the terrain. You're not, you know, you're never lost. Yeah, yeah. I hope so. <laughs> well, no, but come on. I mean, you, you've you met like, uh, let's say, you know, modern Greek, scholars of modern Greece who are just completely lost in Byzantium. Like it's a terrifying, frightening, unknown world. You might as well be science fiction. You know how the adjective Byzantine or Byzantine is used in English, don't you? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, 
yes, frightening and complicated and, and yep. anyway. Um, but you're, you're pretty well grounded in there. And, and I was wondering if your perspective as someone who, who has worked a lot on Byzantine texts and their context, whether that and how that shaped your view of diachronic Hellenism or the Greeks more broadly in ways that you know, you're aware of as being different from what other scholars have done or have you, did it allow you to see things uh, that, that are often passed over? Yeah, you know, Anthony, I would take this right back to the very beginning. I mean, I was 13 years old when I first went to Greece. And coincidentally, um, that was summer holidays. And then the next month in September, I started studying ancient Greek at school. And I was one of a lucky minority, yeah. um, <clears throat> an even smaller minority now, who actually had that, had that opportunity. And ancient Greek, sort of sudden, you know, we began Greek much later than Latin, and everybody in those days, believe it or not, studied Latin. Um, and you know, I, was, I was quite good at Latin, but I never really had the sense that Latin was a language. <laughs> um, it's more like mathematics, you know, which I was no good at. But Greek, when I began learning it, it immediately had the feel of a language, and I just loved it. Yeah. And I learned far more Greek in the th three years I studied in school than I learned Latin in the seven years. Right. But the catalytic point in the middle of that is actually first going to Greece. And, you know, there I was from darkest Scotland, um, suddenly in the middle of a Greek summer, you know, the sun and the sea, and okay, they're the cliches. Well, I'm only 13 years old, you know, this really got to me. And, you know, I was about to start learning this, the ancient language at school, and I could hear people speaking, you know, there you're on the quayside, and they're all sort of, Ella, 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 you know, the people sort of, shouting away in the way that Greek people do. Um, and, you know, I'm thinking age 13, this is the same language, you know, that I'm going to start learning that Homer wrote in, and it's very naive, but it stayed with me. So, you know, in the nature of academic specialism, I did a PhD in modern Greek. Um, I spent most of my teaching career teaching Greek language and then latterly Greek, modern Greek literature. But I, I never lost sight of that bigger picture, that it was, you know, there was, if you like, a kind of in, inherent connection between that landscape and those shouting voices on the quay, mm. and Homer, and Seferis and Kavafi and the people I was teaching, you know, and indeed my students. So it's always, it's always been there for me. And Byzantium, which I... I take your point, I did come to rather later, Byzantium is the necessary missing link that um, you know, connects up the bits of the story. Mm -hmm. um, in a way, it's a kind of summation of, you know, a kind of a break right apart of a lifetime, I suppose. But the, this book is really knitting together the bits of the story that you know, I always wanted to know more about. I always felt it was one story, but never actually had the professional opportunity to explore in the way that once I retired, right. I was able to do. Okay. W were you shocked to find out that uh, a stasis is, is not civil war, but a bus stop? <laughs> well, I think I learned it the other way around, you see. Right, right. <laughs> okay. that, yes. that was the other thing, because I was, I mean, again, there weren't many in the class in Edinburgh in ancient Greek at that time, but I was the only one who'd been to Greece. So it, it was things like, you know, exactly like the bus stop or just the voices on the quay side. I was filtering that in all the way, uh, all the way through. So I, I think that added to the sense I had of ancient Greek as a living language because I'd experienced it um, in its modern form. I see. Yes, uh, well, I mean, Byzantium really is that long transition. Uh, you know, when it begins, you know, people are still worshiping Zeus and, you know, performing Attic declamations and even the Egyptian hieroglyphs are being written. I mean, it's, a, it's an ancient world. And when it ends, it's the society and the culture are so much similar, you know, to, you know, what you could have found in the 20th century Greece. Uh, especially in terms of you know religious life and the language and and so forth and and it's not an accident that 
that many of my Greek colleagues feel much more comfortable in the later Byzantine period than the earlier one, because they, there is a cultural affinity that they can, they can slip into that world far easier than the one a thousand years before when Byzantium begins. So that transformation takes place over the, the course of those centuries. Yeah, I mean, confession here, because the research I've done in the Byzantine period has been largely focused on the 12th century right. and to some extent on the 14th and well, the 12th century and the, to the 15th. So um, I, in a way, you know, I'm one with those modern Greek uh, scholars you, you, you're talking of. Um, and I would, I mean, I, I, I would still have to confess that I'm, um, you know, I'm more at home in the period I mean, for me, the turning point probably is the Battle of Manzikert in 1071. And I feel, or I felt the way I came to Byzantine, Byzantium through modern Greece, I felt more at home in the post manzikert world than in the pre manzikert world. Mm. But the 12th century is still very much anchored in classical antiquity. Uh, the, the romances of the 12th century are after a fashion, imitations of the ancient novels, and you have major classical scholars like Eustathius and so forth, who are part of the world of those novels. So there's a there's a strong classicism going on. Oh, there certainly, there certainly is, and yeah. it was working on that that I really became right. familiar with the the ancient novel. All right, so let's turn to one of the conceptual challenges of writing a global or diachronic history of the Greeks. We'll come back to the term global later. Um, and that is specifically, you know, to decide on who the Greeks are. So what's the definition of, of Greekness here? And the answer that you give in the book, uh, which it sort of enables you to write the book, I think, is to treat the Greeks as the Greek speakers, right? Which yeah. is perfectly legit. You know, that's how you, you, you decide to, to write. even though it's not a linguistic history, it, it's a, you know, full history of people who spoke Greek. So this, this is a different kind of history than if you were to write a history of, say, people who had a self-conscious Greek identity. Uh, because, for example, the, the Bronze Age Greeks, the Mycenaeans, didn't have a self-conscious Greek identity. I mean, they're coming at the beginning of the story. Uh, I, I'm convinced from the Hittite texts and reading of the Hittite texts that they generally call themselves Achaeans as, as they appear in Homer afterwards. Yeah, that was that's that's my understanding too. Yeah, and also the Byzantines, after a certain point, their, their identity is Roman and Christian and Greek, so peripherally in some some ways, even though their language is Greek. Um, eventually, they have these two languages, right? They, they, there's the the elite, the high version of Greek, which is like it's Hellenic, and the colloquial vernacular uh, spoken Greek, which they call Romaic. So this is, it's an important choice. It, it, it results, you know, it has certain uh, uh, consequences. What for you were the advantages and disadvantages of, of defining Greekness in that way? Well, first of all, I mean, <clears throat> I always, I'm, as an admirer of the poet and diplomat, George Seferis, I always follow him in trying to avoid the term Greekness, elinigotita in Greek. Right. So very simply, that's an artificial a priori um, condition that we sort of invent. And he preferred always to talk of Hellenism, Hellenism Mars, which is the totality of the Greek people, the Greek speaking people. Um, so uh, I think you, I think you probably noticed something. That I, the word Greekness doesn't appear in my book, or if it does, mm -hmm. it would only be you know, in a quotation from from yeah. somebody. Else. But sure, I mean, in terms of shorthand, you know what defines Greek in my book? The answer is, as you say, quite rightly, <clears throat> the Greek language. And it is one way of defining being Greek. The advantage, from my point of view, is that it's absolutely solidly based on evidence. We can follow the Greek language through written records that exist pretty well continuously from about 1350 BCE right through to today. And even, you know, there's a gap in the so-called Dark Age from about 1150 to 850. But even then, people in Cyprus were writing a version of the old Mycenaean syllabic uh, script. So there's, <clears throat> there's probably not 
There's not a single century in which Greek is not being written by somebody somewhere. And because we've got that complete written record, we can also see that through those centuries, the language is changing. It's not just a, you know, it's not a hieratic, it's not, a, it's not like Egyptian hieroglyphs, a kind of a language fixed in, in aspic, preserved for, um, you know, for religious or other purposes. It is a language continuously evolving. Therefore, we can infer, I think with absolute certainty from the written record, that the language has never ceased to be spoken either. And that makes Greek, I said in the book, it's one of three languages with such a long, um, long tradition, Chinese and Hebrew being the other. Um, I think in the case of Hebrew, I'm not an expert, I've read that it probably wasn't spoken, it mm. wasn't a spoken language for some of the intervening centuries. But, um, but, you know, let's say there are these three languages, which can boast such a continuous use in both speech and writing. There's only three in the, you know, all the languages spoken in the world today. But coming back to the advantage of focusing on language is we've got the evidence for it. Mm. If you start with anything else, what are you going to start with? I mean, there are lots of, there are, well, there are histories of Greece, which is a place. Mm. And other people have written the history of Greece. Um, and you can indeed write the history of you know, the Greek peninsula or define Greece in various ways, Southern Balkans, Aegean Sea, and you can go right back to the earliest prehistory. Um, but if you think about the history of the Greek speaking people, the act that geographical area is just a speck because the Greek language from very early times, certainly from Alexander the Great onwards, um, and really from the seventh century BC with the great migrations and colonizing around the Mediterranean and Black Sea, the Greek language has been moving out from its homeland all over the world. And that's never more true than during the last <clears throat> 150 years. So that now there are you know, long established Greek communities with roots on all five inhabited uh, continents. So my, so my argument is that the language and the people who speak it and write it, you can follow and you've got documented evidence. Um, <clears throat> go for, if you go for the place, you're narrowing it, the focus too much. And the alternative, I mean, the way the story is traditionally told in Greek, but I, I think certainly not in English and probably not in other languages, is to take the concept of the nation or the people and the problem I have with that is, what are you talking about? How, you, how do you define it? What do you mean by a nation? So you get into that circularity I was talking about earlier. I mean, in one of the sort of groundbreaking moments in Greek history in 1853, the classic Greek historian Konstantinos Papadopoulos wrote, the Greek nation is the sum total of those people who speak the Greek language. Now, if it was so simple, that would be great. And I'm not taking issue with Papadopoulos on that. I'm simply saying, let's take the language that we can document and then let's you know, write the story, read the story. And I'm kind of implicitly saying to the reader, um, because I don't say this in the book, you know, once you've read the story told this way, you know, perhaps you, know, you decide, are we talking about a single nation? And if so, how do you understand a nation applied to that very long history? But I don't want, to, I didn't want to start off with that. You see what I mean? Sure. So in theory, one could take the same approach with other languages that maybe correspond to modern nations or, or peoples. And I was thinking about the case of say English and or the English. Mm. If you took the same approach to that, it would be either very, very different or, or kind of impossible to do. In other words, I'm not sure that you could write a book, The English of Global History, where your criteria would be whoever speaks English. It would just be a very, very different kind of thing and not as coherent. Whereas somehow, um, and I'm not entirely sure why this is, but with the Greeks, you end up with a much more coherent story. And the difference I think is not merely because English expanded a, a, around the world because of empire, because the same thing happened with Greek after Alexander. 
Yeah. And you yeah. have, you know, Greek speaking communities in Egypt and Syria and in Rome, and, you know, wherever, all the way to India, whom you include uh, in your book. And yet it's a much more coherent story. Any reflections as to why that is? Definitely. I mean, I will tell you, my original working title for this book was taken from Churchill, who famously wrote a book called The History of the English-Speaking Peoples. Mm. And I was originally going to call this book The History of the Greek-Speaking Peoples. Mm. <laughs> now, to be honest, I've never actually read Churchill's book. I have read about it, that it is actually, rather as you were saying, a hodgepodge of different mm. stories that don't really add up to one story. Um, I read someone said that, you know, it's basically Churchill, you know, whatever interests me, which is one way of summing up, you know, how English became a global language, I suppose. But I was actually, but and I think it's perhaps, you know, it's, it, it's an interesting, interesting to me you ask that question, because I was actually coming from the example of my own language. And I was inspired by a title that actually originally applied to English, Huh. And thinking, what happens if you if you apply that model to Greek? So, <clears throat> I mean, Churchill has the provocative people's plural, um, mm. and I'm very much kind of sitting on the fence whether the Greeks over that length of time are best thought of as a single people constantly evolving and developing, or different overlapping sets of peoples, in inverted commas, nations, which pass on the sort of baton one to another. And again, I, th I mean, I think there are quite close analogies with, you know, global, global English and the way in which Greek became a worldwide, in my sense, global culture, which, as you say, it, it does indeed begin with Alexander the Great. Mm -hmm. So you know, Greek became an international language, and it's because Greek became an international language for commerce and military stuff, as well as, as more probably more than anything else. That's what brought the philosophy and the literature and the science to, you know, to inspire the Romans and then the rest of the world through European colonization. Um, and then the later diaspora of the Greeks themselves going to all these different uh, different places. So it is, I mean, I think it is analogous because at the point where Greek expands exponentially across a huge landmass, when nobody had ever heard of Greek or spoken that language before, you know, and then suddenly it becomes the main language of all these people. Mm -hmm. In what sense exactly are they Greek? You know, right. Greek. Greek culture, in the same way as you know, is the um, you know is the Nigerian or the Indian who um, speaks English today, yes. um, you know, in inverted commas English. So you've got that it's like that rather uneasy um, uh, sort of mind the gap situation between the continuity of language and the difference of culture and ethnicity, which language both bridges but also can in its own way in hands. So I don't, you know, I don't like to, I, I've tried to get away from the idea that of the Greeks as a kind of, there's a kind of given entity that is always there and never really changes so everything around it does. Um, I just think, you know, empirically, that's not a good way to think about, you know, you might conclude in the end that yes, there is a core to all this and I was struck by what you said just now about the coherence of the story and um, you know I mean I'm glad you thought the way I told the story was coherent but the more fundamental point is that the story of the Greeks does have a thread that you can follow right through it yes you know and kind of creates but I mean, that would create a sort of second order sense of national identity or entity rather than assuming from the beginning that it must be there yes so I suspect that there are around the margins groups that throughout the long story that you tell who, who speak Greek and therefore qualify as Greeks in, in your um, schema, but who are kind of illusory Greeks. <laughs> Here's what I'm thinking. The, the Greek language, the Greek culture 
it, it, it it's exported to all of these territories right throughout you know in, in uh, eastern mediterranean or like from italy to syria and a few in some cases beyond that to the east greek enables people to express themselves in ways that perhaps their local cultures didn't and those expressions come with a you know this tradition of greek writing and epigraphy and you know to converting your local gods into the greek gods and sort of you automatically take on this package of self representation that makes yeah. you look maybe a lot more greek than you actually are and that this diffusion of greek in some places right i'm talking about the margins here it tends to disguise or efface local differences that if you were to meet these people who are you know producing and speaking all of the greek that we have like in egypt and syria and wherever afghanistan you were to meet them and, and, you know, go to their homes and see how they lived like off the record, as it were, you would see an entirely different cultural profile, possibly different identities. And for me, this is like the fascinating part of the story, because they're like also well-known historical individuals who we know or suspect spoke Greek fluently, but we wouldn't classify as Greek. So for example, um, like the, some of the Crusaders, uh, Bohemond, right? And the Normans, um, the French uh, conquerors of the Peloponnese after generation, they were speaking Greek. They produced their literature in Greek. Uh, but of course we regard them as French. But, but if you were to speak to them, they might come across as indistinguishable from people who only spoke Greek or had you know, grown up entirely in a, in a Greek cultural context. And so I think that, you know, the Greeks globally, um, if, you, if you look around the margins, now not most of the story, there are all of these, uh, I, I don't, for lack of a better term, like non-Greek Greeks. Mm. So how do you handle those in the book? Well, one of the things I don't do, actually, is separate them out as a category, because I, I'm rather, I'm rather resistant to that in principle. Um, I mean, to take a step back from that, I mean, in, if you look at the, you know, in the long story, there have been periods of their history where <clears throat> Greek speakers have defined themselves very strongly and definitively in terms of ancestry, mm. what we would call ethnicity, descent. And that's broadly true from about the time of Homer to the <clears throat> end of the fifth century after the Persian Wars and the Peloponnesian War. And it's true again from the 1820s to today but for most of the intervening period, um, I would argue that the view of Isocrates of Athens um, really predominated. And Isocrates famously wrote in 380 BCE that Hellenes from now onwards, Hellenes or Greeks, <clears throat> should be defined not as people who share a common ancestry, but people who partake in our system of education. Mm. And it's that sense of the pride. He was an Athenian, of course, and he was yeah. pushing near education. But it's cool. <laughs> it's, a, it's a pride in the language and all the cultural baggage that comes with it. And I would argue that actually from 380 BC to about the 1790s of our own era, most Greek speakers most of the time would have been content to define themselves, whatever name they used for themselves, whether Greeks or Romans, um, you know, would define themselves in that kind of way that it's the language and the, it's more than the language, it's buying into the culture. That's what makes someone a Greek. I mean, there are, there are famous exceptions from that. There are one or two in Byzantium, as you know, uh, in the uh, Theodoros Laskaris in the mm -hmm. 13th century and uh, George Yemistos Pleton in the 15th. But I mean, these are all the more striking because they are exceptions. I have the impression that you know most Greek speakers for most of that time are really fairly relaxed about you know who their fathers or their mothers were. And you remember um, Ioannis Tsetsis in 12th century Constantinople mm -hmm. who you know he talks about one, one parent comes from Georgia and speaks Georgian and then another comes from Constantinople um, and anyway, he's a real polity someone who lives in the city Constantinople. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really matter where you where you come from. Um, and he, I mean, he ta also talks about all the languages you hear in the street, um, and he seems actually rather modern in um, uh, rather enjoying that fact. Mm. Um, the implication is, you know, we are culturally superior, therefore all these foreigners are coming to us. 
and you know Greeks are fine with that. But to, I mean, your your earlier point about uh, Greeks who are query, maybe not quite Greek. Um, I mean, I certainly, I mean, some of my heroes here, uh, the inventor of the inventor of satirical dialogues, Lucian, hmm. Lucianot, of Samosata, Samsat in southern Turkey today, or I think one of the greatest Greek prose stylists of any period, Heliodorus, of Emesa, modern Homs in Syria. Mm -hmm. And to rub it in, this great stylist whose story begins, the fictional story begins at the Greek center of the earth in Delphi with a descendant of the great Achilles. Um, he describes himself as being from Syria and himself as Phoenician, if you please. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is really buying into a culture at a high level. Um, but to the point where I would really take issue with anyone who says, you know, tries to say to those people, you're not Greek, you can't, you can't. Uh, Claim that. Um, coming later, well, nearer, I mean, closer to your heart, Antony, um, what are most of the Byzantine emperors mm -hmm. who came from places quite far east in Anatolia. And so, even at the time, some people pointed the finger at you know, where their families came from. Um, in what sense are they, if you're looking ethnically, are they, in inverted commas, Greek? Or here is 1821, the um, Admiral Miaulis with the flagship the ships of either, the islands of either and Spetses that dominated the seas and, um, you know, overcame the much larger Ottoman navy with their daring and their fire ships. All those guys spoke Albanian at home, they didn't speak Greek. They used Greek in their church, they used Greek to write their ledgers because they were merchants, and they wrote all their, once they became, you know, politicians in the created a nation state, of course they wrote in Greek, so within a generation they became Greek. But, I mean, that's a phrase I do use quite a lot in my book, actually, sometimes in inverted commas, becoming Greek. Sure. That's a repeated story in, um, in over these three and, a, three and a half thousand years. And I even suspect that some, there's some evidence of that happening even in Mycenaean times, in the Bronze Age, that people in Crete and people in Troy, right. and maybe further in the field that we don't know about, there's a little bit of evidence from those places people who are actually not, again, ethnically Greek, are giving themselves Greek names. They're starting to write in Greek. You know, there's a prestige that comes with Greek. And so within a generation or two, people whose parents or whose original language and culture may be quite different become assimilated. But logically, you would expect that as they become assimilated, so the sort of body politic of the Greeks or Hellenism in general is also going to modulate and change slowly over time, which I think is one way of explaining why, for example, Byzantine society and politics was as different as you could imagine any society and politics as being from that of the Greek city states of a thousand years before. And modern Greece as a nation state and the modern Greek diaspora, I would hazard, um, you know, is as different again. I mean, yes, there is yeah. a heritage which every Greek has every right to be intensely proud of, and I'm sure they are. Um, but I'm kind of emphasizing the diversity within the totality of Hellenism, rather than the kind of solid core that you tend to get from traditional history. Yes, uh, which makes me comfortable because I'm, you know, the Yanis myself. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. A good a mother... My mother arrived in Greece uh, on, on Crete around the time that you did and uh, had some similar experiences. Um, and, and here I am. And I would, in fact, push the same kind of analysis into the classical period, you know, where classicists, I, I don't know if they're uncomfortable with this sort of thing, but they don't highlight it so much. Herodotus's father was uh, Carrion from Halicarnassus. He was mixed background. Uh, mm. Thucydides' family you know, was had these Thracian connections. I suspect he spent a lot of his time in Thrace, possibly with, you know, Thracian intermarriage. Uh, Demosthenes, wasn't his grandmother a Scythian? I mean, so if you start poking around, even in the ancient Greeks, you find very similar kinds of phenomena. Um, and uh, e even the hero of Marathon, Miltiades, he had, he had spent his time as a tyrant in, in, in the, up in the north. And, uh, 
came to Athens and kind of rebranded himself a, a democratic patriot. <laughs> Indeed, and yeah. uh, I mean, was that, and then you know, and then you know, why does why does Pericles narrow the definition of Athenian citizenship? Exactly. Um, yeah, you yeah. know, perhaps because I mean, the implication is that actually people are coming in from outside. Yeah. And you know, and the powers that be are, are, are nervous about that. Doesn't that so, sound like? To now that I mentioned all the classical background, I wanted to ask you how you handle that in the book because there's always this temptation to focus on the classical miracle and and classical antiquity and and I you know I admire it as much as anybody I, I I'm not among the detractors of the classical tradition uh, obviously I'm in a classics department too and, and for a reason but it can be difficult to write the sequel without making it seem as if it's in the shadow of the classical past mm. or trying but failing to live up to it and you know this is one of the problems of writing about byzantine literature for example for a long time in the 19th and 20th centuries it was always like they're they're imitating classical antiquity and failing and so the whole corpus is kind of you know uh, waste how do you handle that the, the the temptation to valorize the classical past so much that the rest seems um, kind of unsatisfying in contrast I mean, I think from the beginning, I, I take issue with that, um, as you put it, valorization. I mean, it's worth remembering that it's, it was actually only from the middle of the 18th century and beginning in Germany that people began to put the ancient Greeks on quite the pedestal that they're, you know, they're, they're, they've been on ever since. Um, and it's is looking a bit rocky now, partly partly because it was built so high and mm. so artificially, um, so that you know it, it's people like um, you know the German art historian um, Winkelmann, you know, who writes in incredibly idealizing terms of the ancient Greeks, and uh, you know the English poet Shelley talks about those those perfect beings that we can hardly imagine as belonging to our kind mm. you know enormously influential and the thing that always rather gets to me is that this idealizing i mean a sort of absurd almost idealizing of ancient greek civilization has fed into the way modern greeks have created their own sense of identity it's lumbered them with a built-in sense of inferiority to the yes. ancestors that I would argue, you know, they just didn't ought to have. But, I mean, like you, I mean, I'm not for a moment um, wanting to detract from the, you know, the importance of ancient Greek civilization. It really is the starting point for so much that we think of as, you know, Western, if not world, um, civilization today. But, I, did, I was determined in the book, in a way, not quite to cut the ancients down to size, but to you know, keep them in their place. Um, and I do, I, I say, you know, I argue in the preface that this is a book not about a Greek civilization and everything else is subservient to that, but to a series of Greek civilizations, one mm. after the other, all of which have actually given something to the rest of the world and drawn a great deal from the rest of the world. So that's already, you know, I'm already kind of contextualizing the ancient world. And I think perhaps, I mean, maybe the two longest chapters are the ones dealing with the Persian Wars and the aftermath, but, you know, they don't get disproportionately um, longer space because if you really want to read just about classical Greeks, there's, you know, there's so much available to read and that's not what I'm trying to do. So for me, the whole, throughout the book, the point is it's almost more the, the tying together of the links than the individual stories, which in themselves are very well known. It's tying them all together to make a single narrative. So I'm just as interested in, you know, how does classical Greece come to emerge from those city states and those rather mm -hmm. bizarre operations of the previous centuries? How does that civilization morph after the Macedonian conquest into something that is both so similar and so different? Um, in the successor kingdoms, where suddenly Greek is a, is a world language being spoken and written all the way to northern India. Um, but the other thing, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't sort of single it out as a theme in the book, but I will just highlight it for you now, because um, it's implicit, I think, in what I write about the ancient Greeks, is that, you know, for all that they did that we do admire, the ancient Greeks did not get everything right. 
No. Um, no. Um, and know. particularly in the Greek story, I mean, you know, the, it really, I mean, it really does get to me, actually. The sto- I mean, the story, particularly of the early fourth century BCE, but it's a continuation of a much older story. What do these Greeks actually spend most of their time doing when they're not writing philosophy or creating <laughs> science or celebrating the Olympic Games? You know, they march out onto a battlefield every spring and they go mm. and they kill each other, um, you know, year after year. And they're constantly fighting for what they call the autonomy of the Hellenes. And what do they mean, for heaven's sake? What they mean is the autonomy of one tiny city-state, not to take orders from another tiny little tiny city-state in the next mountain valley. And the tragedy of ancient Greece, it always seems to me, um, Arnold Toynbee uh, said, makes the same point. He said he's, uh, I, I think that's rather, I admire, I admire him for that. But actually the ancient Greeks failed to create a viable, sustainable political system beyond the level of the city-state. Um, the Byzantines did that in one way, through creating a you know a huge empire. Mm-hmm. But of course, they never called themselves Hellenes officially. Anyway, um, it was a very different thing, and it was actually not until the 1820s that Greeks actually did come together to create a political unity around their shared language and religion. So there's something very specific that the ancient Greeks failed to do. No other Greeks had actually done in that way before. Um, And that's the achievement of the modern Greeks as recently as the uh, the 1820s. But also, I mean, just to set, you know, the, I mean, just to contextualize the over-idealized pedestal of the ancient Greeks, these are truisms, but you know we're very conscious nowadays of the role of women in almost all the ancient Greek city states. I mean, it was the citizens, full citizens, were were male. And what about the role of slavery? There were probably more slaves than free citizens in all these uh, in all these states. It was an achievement built on the absolute, you know, acceptance of the reality that human beings can be bought and sold. And even the great Aristotle um, accepts that as a kind of natural fact. He says it would be unnatural for a polis, for a city-state, to be enslaved to another um, because it's the condition of a slave to be subject to another. So, you know, it's just, again, it's, it's a kind of bizarre hierarchy that so much do the Greeks value the autonomy of their political unit made up of free males. <laughs> that yeah. totally marginalize their female population and they build it on an institution of that we regard as completely inhuman, slavery. So yes, they did give us all that they gave us, but let's not build them up as something that they weren't. They were human beings with human failings, which were very much the failings of their time. Yes, I think your book does that very well. I mean, you you highlight the you know distinctive cultural contributions and achievements of the Greeks at, 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 in any period. Uh, but you don't lose sight of the fact that they also often espouse social va- values that are shocking or repugnant to us at, 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 at any time. And, 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 you know, even in Byzantium, you can definitely find things that today would be completely unacceptable. Um, though it was, I, I think it was a sort of better organized society. Um, yes, I, I'd agree, I agree with you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> For the most part, you, you weren't afraid of the, the, the people from the neighboring valley coming to steal your your, your oxen and enslave your children, which was life in ancient Greece for, for quite, a, quite a bit. Uh, which brings me to the last question here, which is the audience of the book. Well, why don't you tell us about the audience that you had in mind when you were writing this and the challenge of explaining the, the Greek tradition in the long term to people who might not know either anything about it or only some of its phases? Well, I mean, that is that is precisely the challenge, because, I mean, exactly as you say, I mean, you know, everyone who's been to a Greek school is brought up on basically the Papyrigopoulos model of the the a priori Greek nation, which goes through all its vicissitudes and um, uh, ups and downs. But but and therefore the the unity of Hellenism is something that I think, you know, most Greeks, wherever they're brought up, kind of take for, almost take for granted. Um, what they may not realize is that outside that world, um, most people haven't really, it's never not really occurred to most people. 
you know, if they found a Greece at all, it's usually classical Greece. If they're archaeologists, it's going to be Mycenaeans and Linear B. If they're medievalists or if they're, if they're um, into sort of orthodoxy or the history of Christianity, it's going to be Byzantium. <clears throat> if it's, um, you know, European history or modern Balkans, it's going to be modern Greece. Um, but, you know, it's not just academic literature. I mean, brought, you know, books for the general public as well. They pick on any one of those areas or sometimes just a very small part of those areas. But nobody really, I mean, I was astonished, but actually there is barely a book that deals with the whole history of, in English. That's right. It deals with the whole history right through. And yep. the ones that do, actually, the, it, they're more talking about Greece, the land, than, um, you know, than the Greek people, which again moves, move, move around, move around yes. land. But there is a kind of, cult, there's a question of cultural translation here. So, in a way, what I mean, at one level, what I think I'm doing is trying to translate the Greek perception, which is basically derived from Papadigopoulos, to translate that into English and make it meaningful for people who are not themselves Greek and therefore don't feel any need to buy into that story. Um, you know, so if you're not Greek, what did the Greeks ever do for you in the, you know, the famous, um, in yes. the famous phrase? So, and what I'm, what I'm, what I'm, what I'm wanting to show those readers is that actually the Greeks did lots of things and interacted with lots of the rest of us, not just in the ways that, you know, you know about, but at lots of other periods and lots of different ways that you may not know about. And all of that connects and is a part of all our story. But of course, there is the uh, issue that I anticipate because there will be a Greek translation of this book. And... Mm -hmm. How is this going to be read in its, you know, in the language of the people about whom I'm writing? <laughs> because, you know, for them, the story doesn't need to be told. It's already been told. And I think it will certainly, I mean, it, well, I'm not, sure how, I'm not sure how it will play, but I think the emphasis I place on the language and leaving open the question of, of the continuity of ethnicity, whatever exactly we mean by that. Um, I think that's where, you know, my book perhaps risks being controversial in, in, in Greece among Greek readers. But um, what, I, what I hope I'm doing is actually, if you like, you know, culturally translating the Papyrigopoulos vision of a unified, of a total Hellenism, but emphasizing the diversity within it. I mean, I would tend to talk of Hellenism's plural, as yes. Katharina Zakaria has done, no. rather than of um, a kind of national narrative. And as you absolutely rightly say, Anthony, I, you know, I have to do this because I'm precisely because I'm not writing as a Greek. I'm not writing from within <laughs> the nationality that I describe. And how, I mean, yes, I, I read Greek, I speak Greek, I even write in Greek, but I don't have the right to call myself a Greek. Oh, but by your own definition, um, you, you do. And I, I don't think that, I, no, I don't foresee any controversy uh, with the book, and I do hope it's translated. Uh, others uh, of your books have been translated into modern Greek. Um, now, I don't see controversy to the extent that, you know, like, Greeks like to make anything controversial, uh, even if it's not. <laughs> and, you know, the joke about, you you know, you put, you have two Greeks having a political discussion and pretty soon yeah, you have three awesome. political parties. Um, though I know a similar one from your part of the world, which is, like, a traveler goes into a Scottish village and he says, like, how many churches are there here, you know? And, and the person he encounters says, well, we used to have two, but then there was a reunification, so now we have three. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. You have insider cred. Um, you've written books on 19th century Greece and Greek and modern Greek literature and uh, a history of modern Greece. And I think that gives you m lots of points. You know, the, the, the one thing that Greeks are suspicious of are classicists from abroad who, who've learned, who know classical antiquity and think that that enables them to speak about modern Greece or evaluate it or this or that. So that's something that triggers all kinds of defensive alarms. What you have the, like I said, the record 
It does in me too. I mean, I, <laughs> yes, I've yeah, got, no, no, for sure, for sure. Among the older generation, I have classicist friends who really have yeah. very little knowledge or interest in modern Greeks. Yes, who try to avoid it actually. In, in actually, yes, I mean, I do. I, yeah. Though I, I think much, I think much less, much less among younger scholars actually. Sure. And the Paparigopoulos story, which I'll explain in the intro, so that people know what what that narrative refers to. I think it's less dominant among many, many Greeks than one would think. Uh, I have conversations very often which imply that the that narrative has not been accepted, um, especially about Byzantium. I tend to have more conversations about that. There's by no means a universal consensus or understanding that, quote, Byzantium was Greek, like end of story. And that I think moving forward in the next generation, there's going to be need for a plural approach, right? For, for Hellenisms, for lots of different cultural phases and for people of different cultural background, just as we, we mentioned many of them from, you know, French crusaders to the Herodotus who enter the mainstream of the Greek tradition. And, you know, right now, for example, there's the sort of amazing example of a basketball player, right? Oh yeah. yes. Yes, yes. Uh, Adendo Kumbo, who is gradually establishing himself in the pantheon, right, of famous global Greeks. Well, I mean, that's a, that's a, yes, I mean, that's a very good example of what we were talking about earlier, the, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, the, the ethnically Greek, but actually right. um, culturally, uh, culturally are. And I mean, on that question of continuity, you know, how, how Greek was Byzantium, I mean, the other big uh, elephant in the room, I would say, is the Ottoman period which mm. is so often cut out of the story of continuity yes. or when it's in there it's only as you know it's the um you know the sort of sub the sort of enslaved nation but actually i mean i and i do try to play this up in my book um you know the importance of greeks both as intellectuals and as um entrepreneurs um and sometimes as political figures in the ottoman empire that um you know greeks made a contribution to that multilingual, multicultural empire, which it's unfortunate and unnecessary to airbrush, airbrush out. And conversely, the Ottoman legacy is part of the story, by definition, of modern, modern Greece and modern, modern Greeks. So, I mean, you could imagine, you know, a future version of, you know, the long story where Byzantium maybe feels less Greek and the Ottoman period might <laughs> even feel more, feel more Greek. Yes, yes. We're, we're away from that. <laughs> um, but uh, no, I, I know what you mean. And someone had to row all of those galleys. Uh. <laughs> anyway, thank you, Roddy. Uh, this was, uh, it was, it was fascinating conversation. And the, I recommend, I strongly recommend the book to anybody interested in the diachronic experience and different cultures of the Greeks. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you, Anthony, and thank you for inviting me onto your podcast.